it's time for me to comment about it. Ladies and gentlemen, if we hit the members goal this month, Dark Side Phil reacts to down the rabbit hole, Dark Side Phil. With over 6 million views, Frederick Knudsen's Dark Side Phil down the rabbit hole is the most watched DSP video of all time. Frederick's documents Darkside Phil career from his fighting game tournaments to being fired from his machinima contract. This video has been a great success worldwide. Phil wanted to endure this video on his YouTube platform at a cost of having a 400 membership goal. From the last two years, everybody is trying to live back to their normal lives. The cost of living has made it difficult for some to afford food, their mortgage, to pay for gas and much more. My video was created for one purpose. Not everybody can afford a membership and I personally feel this isn't fair for a membership goal to take place to endure a video. Phil has talked about his experience online in the past where this has been discussed on the Down the Rabbit Hole video. If Phil does his endure, he will only stall for time by pausing the video a lot, reading contributions, and I feel he won't give his honest narration. Anything he will say in the endure will more likely be in my video, and anything else would be a prediction. Why wait for his endure where you have got it right here? This video is for you. With a lot of time and dedication making this video, I hope you will find this an enjoyable experience. The only thing I would like to add. If you can, please like this video. This will be a blessing for me. Also, if you're not subscribed, you're more than welcome to subscribe on here. I'm merely up to 10,000 subscribers and I love to reach this goal very soon. In fair use, the Down the Rabbit Hole video is sampled throughout this video using Phil past comments on his own personal experience. Are you ready? Let's get down to it. Enjoy. Of the internet's content creators, there are few so controversial as Philip Burnell, better known online as Darkside Phil, styled with a Y. Since 2008, he has uploaded tens of thousands of videos, usually 10 to 20 minutes long, and he still uploads more than a dozen daily. Because this channel's been around for 12 years and has some 60,000 plus videos on it. Actually, it might have even more than that at this point. You need to have a sponsorship, you need to have a partnership, you need to have all these kind of extra revenue streams coming in in order to make a living doing this anymore. So by the time that I changed my content up, and by the way, why did I do it? I did it because YouTube fucked up and essentially two, three years ago, they, they demonetized DSP Gaming. They told me, oh, you can't monetize the channel anymore because it's been identified as spam by Google+. I don't even want to get into that fiasco because that was 100% a technical error on YouTube side that then they ended up fixing it, but it fucked over my channel for like two months. I don't want to get into it. But anyway, at that time, I said, why am I going to continue doing what I'm doing when I'm, I'm basically making next to no ad revenue on my videos anyway? I'll just go to long form videos. It's easier for me. I don't have to break up the video as much when I'm recording. It's easier for you. It's less videos in your inboxes. People have asked me to do this for years and years. I might as well just do it. So here's what happened. I went from 15 to 20 minute long videos to hour long videos and my ad revenue halved. Just like I always knew it would and I told you guys it would over the years. I said if I do this my ad revenue will half because I'm doing half as many videos and it absolutely did. It went whoop. And I was like well the good news is it wasn't a lot anyway. It, I wasn't making a living on ad revenue anymore. So it didn't really significantly matter that I made that change at that time. But the point is, if I had done that earlier, like everyone was screaming for me to do and YouTube was telling me to do, oh, you got to change, you got to change, I would have went out of business. One of the biggest hassles of being a YouTuber back in the day was that you could only upload like 10 to 15 minute clips. Now, I'm recording six to seven hours of gameplay a day. You know how many clips that was to upload in a day? Having to individually number and do all that shit. Now keep in mind back then, I didn't do custom thumbnails, I didn't actually name the video specific things, so it was a little bit easier then, but 
Basically, it was a ton of busy work. And by the way, back then, this also was an issue. Unlike today, admittedly, YouTube has dramatically improved when it comes to the uploading of videos. You could just set them all up, put the data on them, and just leave them be and trust YouTube to work. This is in addition to another channel where he uploads video logs or vlogs where he talks about himself and what he's doing, typically for over an hour at a time. The other thing is, because I'm not uploading so many videos to DSP Gaming, there's no reason why the 20 so thousand people, I think it's like 29,000 people who are subscribed over on the King of Hate Vlogs, why some of them can't come over here and sub and still get access to all the content they used to like. Because the truth of the matter is, people over there basically were kind of, you know, uh, stagnant. That channel was dead, right? There's, I wasn't actively doing stuff over on the King of Hate vlogs. That channel would sit there for two, three months untouched, and all of a sudden a new video would pop up, and maybe like 500 people would watch it. You see, like, it was de a dead channel. When you can't even get a thousand views on a, on a, on a video anymore uh, uh, of a series that used to get like 10,000 views, that obviously means the channel's dead. So I figured it makes more sense to pr bring everything over here and focus everything on DSP Gaming. And by the way, no, I'm not closing that channel. The King of Hate Vlogs will stay there as an archive of the eight, to, I think I opened it in 2012. So it's basically about 10 years of archived footage of vlogging that I did. It's a history of stuff that I've done on the internet. It's awesome to stay there. And I welcome you to go check out that archive of the stuff. But from now on, stuff like DSP Tries It, Ask the King, Feasting with the King, etc., will be here on DSP Gaming. On his Patreon page, he makes over $1,000 every month from nearly 200 different patrons. But, you know, since I became a full-time streamer, I don't really focus on Patreon anymore. But that's what I used to do. It was all the patrons would have choice to do this kind of stuff, you see? And I haven't really talked about this recently because, you know, let's face it, I don't really emphasize the Patreon anymore because we're more stream-focused for the last three freaking years. It's all about the streams, right? I did, I was doing that for years and it reached kind of its natural conclusion at the end of 2017 when people said, we don't want to contribute via Patreon anymore because we want to contribute via the streams. That was the thing. People wanted to be an interactive part of these streams, so they stopped pledging to Patreon, right? I didn't tell them to, they naturally just did this by themselves. Searching for him on YouTube, however, brings up far more than just his own videos. There are numerous clips and compilations of his gameplay constructed to mock and tease him, while others offer commentary on what has gone wrong with his channel, implying that he once had a loyal and enraptured fanbase. All the other shit is bullshit fucking speculation. It's all half-truths or quarter-truths or based on this tiny little itty-bitty piece of something that's true completely blow it up and extrapolate it to a point where it's not true at all it's blatant fucking slander is what it is it's defamation at its worst why on earth would i want to go through every piece of defamatory shit ever said about me why it's ludicrous nonsense it's a bunch of conspiracy horse shit why would i waste my time on that it's not even factually corroborated if all the things that people have said about me were true I'd be in jail right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? I be, you know, what are you talking about? It's all fake. Let's be honest. Take a look at that that video. W what did Phil do? He made bad gameplay. He said some racist things. He was uh, a toxic guy in the Street Fighter community. This is it, and it's all documented, right? It's literally all documented right there in a in a video that I put out, <clears throat> right? Now look at all the shit that came after, right? It has nothing to do with my my any video that I've put out, right? When you watch my videos, do you hear talking about my personal bankruptcy, right? Is that a major topic that I'm reviewing all personal information about myself? Is it a fucking stupid, slanderous things about fucking escorts? Do I sit here and talk for hours on end about mobile gaming conspiracies? No, it's bullshit. The difference between the original video there by Frederick Knudsen and all the shit after is that his is based on factual shit that happened, corroborated stuff. You can prove it's there because I uploaded it myself. All I care about is coming to Phil's streams, having a good time, right? Learning what he thinks about his particular game he's playing and having a chill experience and an entertaining one. And you know what? That's exactly my mentality. I don't care about the drama. I don't care about the bullshit. 
I'm just here to have a good time on my own stream. And if you notice, it never comes up unless someone brings it up. I'm not, I don't, you know, I don't care about what a million people say about me on the internet every day. As long as I have my own place to share who I am and my passion for games on a daily basis, I'm thankful for that. He often is cited by other content creators as a negative example, though their reasons for doing so often remain vague. It's like, that's the fucking dark side Phil style of doing things. Blame everybody that isn't you. But most of the shit in the last few years that involves me has nothing to do with me. I'm serious. It's all bullshit. It's all people, people made it up. People on the periphery of my streams trying to get involved with drama and shit. And I'm not involved in it. Like someone just brought up, what about OIC? What about him? How the fuck do I know anything about what that, what that was? I had nothing to do with it. I'm here. Here's what, what I do. I come to my stream. I turn it on. I talk with you guys in stream chat. I play games. I try to keep nonsense out of the chat. And that's it. I don't have anything else to do with it. Nothing. I don't watch 14, 15 corroborating hours of drama content every day. I don't have time to waste. I'm a 40-year-old running a business that has a, a personal life. I'm not a loser who sits on the internet and is looking for drama and conspiracy all day long. I want nothing to do with that periphery bullshit. I'm nothing. I'm not even involved in the periphery bullshit. You see what I'm saying? <clears throat> Though he would commonly compete in local tournaments, he struggled to place and earned himself the title of the King of Hate. Philip himself claims that this nickname was earned due to the unpopular opinions he touts and because he uses the hatred against him as a motivator, but other tournament goers tell a different tale. Way, way back in the day, <clears throat> alright, before I ever was a content creator for the internet of any kind, before I ever made a single video for YouTube, I used to be part of the competitive Street Fighter community. I was an asshole. I was a troll like crazy. Like when, in my, when I was in my 20s, I was such a dickhead. All right. I was a complete ass. All right. I was. I will tell you that today. I did so much bullshit trolling online to people. I really look back today and I'm like, man, I was a complete scumbag. And of course, I wish I could go back and change the things I did, but I can't. What happened happened back then right <clears throat> and so when i would would announce i was going to attend a street fighter tournament or whatever back in the day people would literally crap all over me oh that guy's a scrub oh that guy sucks that guy's terrible that guy won't don't worry about that guy talking shit on the internet he ain't gonna do nothing in the tournament he's gonna job he's not gonna place at all he's gonna lose to everyone and i'll be honest with you <clears throat> all right for a while that was true I was one of the biggest shit talkers in the Street Fighter community. And I would go to tournaments and I would lose. And that's embarrassing. You talk big, you're supposed to back it up. But eventually, eventually, that did change. After years of dedicating myself to going to tournaments and playing. By the way, there was no online play back then. It was all playing stuff in person. Okay? Traveling, playing tons, paying tons of money to do all this. To play Street Fighter in person at tournaments. I actually got good enough that I started winning tournaments. And the King of Hate moniker originated not because I was a hateful person and I was a dick and I'm the king of that. It was because so many people hated on me saying that I wasn't good enough. I wasn't ever going to be a, a tournament level player. I was just a scrub, a kid on the internet, a nobody, an asshole, a piece of garbage. To some extent, a lot of that was true because I was an asshole for sure. But, but. I would use that hatred thrown against me to motivate myself to continue to play and get better at the games until I could actually become a tournament winner. And I did. They claim that he received this nickname because of his bouts of rage, argumentative disposition, and poor conduct. DSP, stop recording. No one gets a shit. Play. You can't hold up a tournament. Where am I playing? You still haven't told me. <laughs> Jesus Christ, I treat you like you're a <laughs> Want me to write a fucking tournament for you? That was the worst tournament I've ever been to. It was insanely poorly run. They were understaffed. They didn't know what they were doing. And they would tell you it was time for your match, and you'd sit around for two hours and not get called for your match. So in that that tournament, I was recording for you two. And they kept calling me for my match, and I would walk up and say, I'm here, I'm ready. And then they would never call me to play. So eventually I got angry. That's what the infamous video is, where they keep calling me. I'm up, I'm up. I was like, you still didn't tell me where I'm playing. Tell me where I'm playing, and I'll go play. 
and they never answered me. So then I went and he took a shit because I had to take a shit in my hotel room. I come back, they said, you're disqualified from the tournament. So I basically told them to go fuck themselves. And then everyone basically had a big uprising against them because they didn't know what the fuck they were doing. So everyone collectively went up to them and basically they had to refund a ton of the entry fees because everyone was so angry that the tournament was so poorly run that they gave back a ton of money to the people who attended because they didn't know what the fuck they were doing. But it was just a waste of time. It was such a, so annoying. <laughs> In 2005, Philip decided that he would take out thousands of dollars in credit card loans to attend the Evolution Championship Series, better known as EVO. For what was going on, the years of 2005 through 2007 were the years where I was incredibly into and dedicated to Street Fighter. I was playing it all the effing time. My free time was all Street Fighter. My travel was all Street Fighter. All my money for my, you know, went into this hobby that was Street Fighter. So at the time, I would be traveling to places like Texas and Philadelphia and stuff like that. I would go all around the country traveling and participating in these tournaments. And incidentally, it was around this time period when I met John Rambo for the first time and we became friends and later on travel companions going to all those tournaments. But the thing was, that whole year, I had traveled the country to play Marvel vs. Capcom 2 and Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo. And I knew that I was moving out of my apartment. I had an apartment. Like I said, this three-bedroom apartment. I knew eventually I'd be moving out, but it was still it's like six months on the lease. And I didn't know where I was going to get the money from to pay the bills. I didn't know anything at that point. I did have a job interview lined up for Best Buy uh, in a few weeks. But basically, it was like a couple weeks before Evo. And I said, I want to go so bad because I've been practicing this. Everything I've been doing, waiting for. But it was a huge risk because I didn't have the money to go. So I did one of the dumbest things I've ever done in my life. And please, I beg of you. Unless you're on your last legs financially, do not ever do what I'm going to tell you I did to pay for my Evo trip. I took cash advances on all of my credit cards. So we're talking thousands of dollars in cash advances. I ended up paying off the interest alone for that for about five years. I'm not kidding. The reason that I had such credit card debt, and I told you just recently that I paid off all my credit card debt a year or two ago, is because that dumb decision to take out like three thousand dollars with cash advances on my credit cards fucked me up financially for years so don't fucking do it unless you're destitute okay latching on to this accomplishment he quickly proclaimed himself the best super street fighter 2 turbo player in america since no other american players had placed above him but other players in the community were unimpressed. This particular tournament used a special version of the game ported from the arcades onto the PlayStation game console, and this port was widely considered to be far less balanced and vastly inferior for numerous reasons. What had happened is that recently, games such as um, Third Strike and Super Turbo had been released on the Xbox, and people were playing them on the Xbox online. And so they were playing that way. Now, it was incredibly laggy, and it was very hard to learn anything, but that was the best you got back there then, okay? And what EVO decided to do is they wanted to, for the first time, they wanted to convert their tournament from an all-arcade cabinet tournament to all consoles. But Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo by far had a bad run when it came to console versions. In this particular case, they decided that for EVO 2K5 2005, they were going to use the PlayStation 1 version from the Street Fighter collection of Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo. And what a gaffe that was because people were like, oh, we can't find that game. The game's like three years old. It's hard to get your hands on now. A lot of people, you know, didn't like that version of the game. In fact, I'll tell you that right now, that version of the game is far from arcade perfect. It's got tons of differences. Lots of timing issues, hitboxes that were changed, damage level output that was changed. There's a lot about that game that was changed on the console version, the PS1 version in particular. So I go out there. And I immediately notice there's an arcade cabinet for Super Turbo, but I'm like, but that's not arcade Super Turbo. What is it? Well, there's a guy, his name is Cigar Bob. I have no idea if he's still around, but at the time, he was an OG. That's what they called him, an OG, whatever, who back in the day was known for playing Super Turbo, but he actually owned arcade cabinets. He built his own cabinets, and he actually built this custom setup where you could have different joystick types and things installed in this cabinet, and it would hook up to a TV that two people could play on. So you could play PlayStation 1 Super Turbo with your style of controller or joystick, almost like you're at an arcade. And so basically, 
What everyone ended up doing for two days before the actual EVO event happened is practice the fuck out of the PlayStation 1 version of Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo and tried to learn the differences in the game. Now, it's funny to me because I was there, Cigar Bob was there, there were a bunch of people there who I was very friendly with and I was playing, but it was none of the OGs, right? It wasn't the guys who were synonymous, the Mike Watsons, the Alex Valles, the John Choice. None of them were the people who were really playing. It was other people who were playing and trying to basically learn the differences between PS1 Super Turbo and Arcade Super Turbo. So when we actually played in the tournament, we know what we were doing. Right? Instead, we said, instead of bitching about it, which is what it seemed all the OGs were doing, we'll just play the game and learn the differences so we know for the tournament. So for two days, I was in intense amounts of uh, practice and training, basically, for PlayStation 1 Super Turbo. And during that period of time, I learned some major differences about the game, including the fact that some characters were different sizes. They weren't as tall or as short as they were supposed to be, and they had different hitboxes. I found out certain characters did different stun amounts than they did in Arcade Super Turbo. I found out that one of my characters, Vega, was incredibly easy to do these complex combos with, which actually was harder to do in the arcade version of the game. So for me, I was like, wow, I might have gotten off a little easy here because my character's actually better. Now, anyone who practiced knew that. The problem was people were, ah, oh, it's Super Turbo, I'm, I'll just show up and I'll just play, right? Because they think, oh, I've been playing this since the 90s, I don't need to practice or anything for all these newcomers that are here, fuck them. What those guys did, they sat and they bitched and moaned about, oh, it's not Arcade Super Turbo, I don't want to play PS1 Super Turbo, wah, 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 instead of sitting down, which is what I did, sat down with the game for two days, played the fuck out of it, and I learned all the differences of the game. And once I knew all the differences of the game, I knew what was going to work in the tournament and what wasn't. The bottom line is, by the end of the day, I literally beat like five more OG players, the only person I had lost to in the tournament is someone I've never effing beaten Super Turbo. His name's Bucktooth. I don't even know if he fucking plays anymore. I really don't. So it was funny because I lost to him and got sent to the loser's bracket. But then as I went through the loser's bracket, I literally cleaned out the fucking bracket, beating everyone. So now it's a huge controversy because day guess what? Finals day. Guess how many OGs were in the finals? Zero. They didn't make it. They all got eliminated. They all fucked up in the early stages of the tournament and lost. They didn't make it to the finals. And so what ended up happening, I got fourth place. The top three places were all Japanese players. So I ended up basically being the highest ranking American for Super Turbo that year, which was so much... Ha! Ah, Dark Side Phil! He placed that high in a tournament. How could this... This is bullshit. This just proves that console versions will never be accepted. Of course, today, for every game except Super Turbo, we all play console versions. Because this was where it was going. But those OGs just didn't want to let go. Okay? I was the best Super Turbo player that year. Period. It doesn't matter if you put 4,000 asterisks next to it. If you say that you had a... Oh, my toe hurt that day. Or, oh, I, I had the sniffles and I couldn't play. Oh, my joystick wouldn't stop spinning like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I won. For two more years, he would compete in tournaments, but he never found success like he had at the 2005 EVO event. Most other high-level competitors saw his fourth-place victory as a fluke due to the version of the game being played and the lack of other high-level competition, and his tournament results after EVO were seen to reflect his true level of skill. I was looking for. You got some idiot named DSP who's a total piece of shit, by the way. I like to, I like to get that on YouTube. But, but this guy thought he was hot shit because he beat me and Choi in a game that was like... It's like fucking Neo Geo conversion of Street Fighter or some crap, dude. <laughs> and, he, and he was so proud that he put under as a signature, he's the number one US ranked Super Turbo player that year. But I mean, look at him now. After that, he actually went on YouTube and sent me a PM and apologized for doing it. He said that he had gotten caught up in the moment and he didn't really mean it and he apologized to me and I accepted his apology, so there's no beef. Obviously, he's a pretty bad driver, but uh, apparently they're all drunk. Right? I mean, how long did it take me to adopt direct capture? I was doing just a video camera, or I wasn't even a video camera, it was just a regular camera, recording video content of my television until 2013. 
And at that point, most people who wanted to do videos on the internet of gaming had already adopted a method of direct capture. They weren't doing that kind of stuff anymore, right? In 2013, I adopted direct capture. Instead of pointing a camera at my television, yes, from the years of 2008 to t early 2013, I pointed a camera at the TV. I didn't even direct capture, okay? <clears throat> didn't even use a microphone until 2013. Yeah, how primitive was that? In the year of 2013, I started doing direct capture and live streaming. But even then, <clears throat> I still was acting as if basically it wasn't really a job. Even though I worked my butt off and I was making ridiculous amounts of content for you guys, I ignored my live streaming audience. I streamed, but didn't talk with you guys at all. I didn't read the chat. I didn't interact with you guys. There was no shout outs, no discussion. It was as if you guys were not there. It was basically like I was ignoring you and I was just sitting here like this, playing a game like this, doing commentary, telling you everything going on in the game, swearing at the game and raging, and paying no attention to you whatsoever. All right? <clears throat> now, today, I am mature enough, I am professional enough, and I am smart enough to tell you that that was a big mistake. It was, okay? Philip's pattern for video production was mostly consistent. He would play games in blocks of several hours, recording his playing session by placing a camera on a coffee table near the screen. Once he was finished playing, he would chop up the videos into approximately 10 minute segments and upload each of those segments onto his gaming channel individually. And again, keep in mind, this is something that I did absolutely without any profit for th almost three years. So. I did it for the love of it for almost three years, and then when it was profitable where you could do it, I started making money. Compare that with people who were vloggers and only made vlog style videos and monetized those to make money, and then all of a sudden when gameplay videos were able to be monetized, they all became gamers overnight. And I hate to say it, but Toby Turner um, was definitely one of those. I think I Justine was one of those where she was into vlogging and then all of a sudden she starts playing games when she can monetize the videos but never did it before that. Um, and that's when I got pissed at those people and started calling them out and being like, they weren't genuine. Those are people who are doing it literally for the money. They only made a video after they could monetize it. So what the fuck? There's no passion there, you know? Um, but I was one of the few people who was doing it for the love of it for two and a half, three years, and was putting out more content faster than anyone else. So yes, it was definitely the timing, but it was also the insane amount of hard work I put in to establish myself where I was, so then when the money was able to be created, boom, I was there for it. You know what I mean? <clears throat> now, sadly, things are so oversaturated, good luck getting your foot into that market. You know what I mean? Like, trying even to just step in, there's so much competition. So much competition. Apparently, Ubisoft had seen some of Philip's gameplay footage of Splinter Cell Conviction and complained to the YouTube administrators, who promptly shut down his channel out of fear of litigation. YouTube then contacted Ubisoft to verify the concern, but Ubisoft stated that they had made no such claim. In fact, it had been an anonymous internet user who had created a false account in an attempt to shut down Philip's YouTube channel, at least for a time. Why they wanted this is uncertain, but the channel was reinstated shortly after. Yeah, like, there were games back in the day that I just said, fuck this, and I quit for various reasons. Splinter Cell Conviction is because false copyright strikes, claiming they were Ubisoft and they were shutting me down, which they weren't, but I had no desire to go back to the game after I got the copyright strike cleared up. Splinter Cell Conviction is a game from 2010 that I stopped playing because I got false copyright strikes against my channel. And I basically stopped putting out videos on Dark Side Phil during that, that time because the channel got shut down unjustly. Then later on, it was determined it was false copyright strikes and the channel was restored, but I had already started DSP Gaming. I don't think anyone wants to see Splinter, Splinter, Splinter Cell Conviction, so I'm never going to go back to it. There you go. Okay. Near the end of that year, he was laid off from his job, and so he established a Google AdSense account to start monetizing his videos. For those of you who don't know, I used to work for a company. It was called Helicopter Support. I didn't quit my old job. I didn't leave it. I got laid off. And there were one or two people who I was still friendly with and I would chat with every once in a while. And one of them was actually like, man, I hate this company. I want to get out because it's falling apart. Since you got laid off, everything's terrible and more people are getting laid off and I got to get out of here. And when I told them what I did for a living, I'm uploading videos to YouTube full time. They were like, hey, how much money do you make? I was like, oh, you know, like three times more than what I was making at the company. And they were like, what the fuck? Really? I was like, yeah. 
I make a ridiculous amount of money just uploading videos to YouTube. It's stupid. Okay? And so they asked me, they were like, do you need any help with that? Or is there some way I could get in on it? I said, if you want to get in on it, it's, you know, it's tough because you got to find a niche. You got to find something people want to watch videos on. And when I explained to them my creative process and the things that I did, they were like, fuck that. I don't want to do that. But they were like, hey, can I help you with your job? Is there anything that's like tedious or bad about your job that maybe I could throw, you know, I could work an hour or two a day and you could throw me a few extra bucks? And at that time, I actually, uh, I actually thought about the possibility of hiring someone as a part-time worker. Along with this, he started a new series on his blog channel in October of that year called DSP Tries It, where he would review food items and occasionally video game peripherals. These videos would also be monetized under his AdSense account. Now, one of the things we were doing in celebration of hitting that streak was I was doing festival celebrations once a month. We were doing a special day where basically we would do a bunch of fun stuff, including the revival of DSP Tries It. This is the series where I try various products. Usually it's some kind of food or drink. And you guys used to love DSP Tries It back in the day. Then it went on hiatus for a couple years. But this year I brought it back as a way to celebrate the ongoing vest streak. Well, that's all over with, right? And since it's over with, um, that's the end of DSP Tries It. It's over forever. I'm never doing another episode again. <laughs> we had all new shows. Feasting with the King right never did that before and that's just an extrapolation on what i was doing with dsp tries it and made it a better show in my opinion you guys really seem to like that show even though i think that we should do it only every couple of months to keep it special once his adsense account was approved he began requesting that his viewers interact with his videos more strongly implying that viewers should click on ads in an effort to increase his revenue what he wasn't aware of was that asking viewers to click on ads was disallowed in the contract for AdSense, and so his account was banned, meaning that he could no longer make money directly off of advertisements for any of his videos on any of his channels. Um, this was after I had just lost my job, and I didn't know how I was going to pay the bills anymore, and you couldn't even monetize gameplay videos, so I had put ads on the videos on th that vlogging channel, and I was trying to find things that would bring people to the vlogging channel. So one night I had a few too many to drink, and I said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do the Axe Body Detailer DSP Tries It. What this was was a little loofah scrub thing that men could buy or was supposed to be for men. And you scrub your body with it, okay? Um, I made this video of me in the shower topless, scrubbing my body, basically slurring my words because I had drunk, drank so much, all right? Uh, it went viral. Within a day, the thing had something like 30,000 views, if not more. Um, and honestly, because I was making so much, you know, I, there was, there were ads on it and people were, were going crazy for the ads. I made like a thousand bucks in a day on that video, which is out of control, right? But that video got so much attention. Guess what? That was the video that triggered YouTube seven plus years ago to think that I was cheating with the AdSense program. And they contacted me and said, we're kicking you out of the AdSense program on this channel because we suspect that you're, that you're, you're, you're sitting there clicking on the video to get ad revenue because you made so much in one day. And I was like, I didn't. It was the viewers. The viewers went nuts for this crazy video and probably went over and went, oh, I want to support Phil, the underdog. He just lost his job. Let's all click on the ads or whatever, which you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to do that on YouTube. No, you're not supposed to ever try to ask, uh, uh, have someone click on ads or anything. It's supposed to be of their own free will. So YouTube falsely accused me of doing this myself, of all things, or employing bots and stuff to click on this video, which I never did, and they kicked me out of the AdSense program because of this video, all right? But to this day, people still spread misinformation that gets people into trouble. Like, for example, last night on Twitter, someone was posting up about some other YouTuber, don't know who the hell it is, I don't know who they were talking about, and they were like, how does someone get in trouble with AdSense on YouTube because here's someone who's blatantly telling their viewers to click on the video click on the ad, do this, whatever, okay? And someone references me from 10 years ago and says, well, here's what happened. Do they call me DSP? Because he said this. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Again? People are saying this. Like, after 10 fucking years, people are still spreading this misinformation. Still! So I responded. I was like, no, no, stop. Please stop spreading this bullshit. It's not true. It's not because I said or did anything. It's because of what actually happened with the videos themselves. Because that's the truth of the matter. 
You can say anything, but it's only until something actually happens that really, you know, there's a repercussion for it. Philip began uploading his videos to Blip.tv, a competing video hosting service, and received a lucrative partnership offer. Only a few months after he began using Blip, however, he was banned from the site for making numerous anti-Semitic jokes. This is what happens when you lip sync. I go to Blip TV, right? I become the second biggest guy on the site within a month. But then I get kicked off the site for making a very, very insensitive racist jokes. Okay? 100% today I can say that. You know, back then I did the wrong thing. I never should have made those kind of jokes. They're way too insensitive and hurtful to a certain group of people who definitely don't fucking deserve to be treated and talked to talked about like that. It's ridiculous that I thought that it was funny. And I'm very apologetic today that back then I was an immature idiot and I did that stuff. Okay? So I get kicked off at Blip TV without any kind of discussion. It wasn't even like, oh, we'll talk about it. You can't do that kind of content. Remove that content and moving forward, you know, be a better person. It was just, you're off Blip. All right, I thought that was completely unfair. I was treated unfairly. You should at least give me a chance, right, to do the right thing. I was immature back then. I should have you know, known better at the very same time. Give me a chance to learn and grow. They didn't do that. They just said, you're gone. Within a few years, Blip was gone. Completely gone. Just, boop, they failed as a business off the internet. If I had stayed on Blip, I might have literally gone out of business myself. Because all my content would have been on there housed. Now what am I going to do? Upload four years of gameplay to DSP Gaming on YouTube in one fell swoop? No. I mean, that would have been ridiculously terrible. In March, however, Philip was approached by Machinima Incorporated, a company that contracts content creators chiefly for gaming videos to become a managed partner. By allowing Machinima to place advertisements on his videos under their AdSense account rather than his, he could continue making money through videos on YouTube as a full-time career. Focus. So I created two new channels on YouTube. The first channel is called DSP Gaming. This is my active channel for video game playthroughs. On the other side... 2008 to 2010, I used shitty quality cameras. Then in 2010, I kind of upgraded to more professional quality stuff. It got so popular that when I lost my job in 2010, people started supporting me as the underdog of YouTube. And then I started, you know, doing it for a living in 2011 when finally it was able to partner with the company and monetize your gameplay videos. It had not been possible up until late 2010, early 2011 to even do that on YouTube. And the rest is history, you know, blew up 2011, 2012. I became virally popular on YouTube. Every game I played got ridiculous amounts of views. Of course, then, as you know, guys, things changed over the years and people all of a sudden started getting a negative association with me. But anyway, 10 years, all right, 10 years years of me being a content creator for the internet right pretty awesome right pretty damned awesome and i'm so incredibly grateful for 10 years now keep in mind there's been ups and downs there have been times when i was hanging out with my friends and i was able to afford going to crazy gaming conventions and things were amazingly positive and everything was great there were times when I had financial difficulties because of negative shit done to me because of YouTube changing their algorithms, me being able to pay my bills, and obviously breaking up with my ex-girlfriend and all that kind of shit. There have been low lows. There have been high highs and low lows. It has been one hell of a ride the past 10 years. If you would ask me at any point in my life until I started on YouTube if my life would ever be as crazy as it was the past 10 years, I would say, fuck no. Are you nuts? It's been nuts, man. Seriously. Um... And it's hilarious because even to this day, people ask me, Phil, can you predict where you'll be in five years? Fuck no. I have no idea. Who knows what's going to happen? This is a, such a wild ride doing this kind of thing on the internet for a living. It really has been insane. Um, but again, your support has made it all possible. All right. Because because we've seen this insane amount of clicks on your, on your video ads, it, it was just like proportionally ridiculous. You know, my video gets 10,000 views, but the ads get insane amount of clicks on it while someone else who has a video with 10,000 views only gets a very small amount of clicks it didn't it, it obviously didn't seem like a natural amount and because of that they said well we can't have that you're basically making way too much money on these ads and we can't even tell sell if this is valid clicks where uh you know this would turn into a turnover you know what i mean a click that turns into a sale essentially so at that point they suspended my adsense and i said well i need to make a living elsewhere so i went and got my partnership with machinima and the rest was history um yeah, you know, when that shit happens when you're under a, a managed partnership, it doesn't really affect anything anymore. So I was protected from any further 
malicious activity or whatever at that time. But keep in mind, this was 11 years ago. The whole program was different. So what ended up happening was over time, YouTube re completely redid their whole program. They made it so invalid click activity doesn't count anymore. If someone sits there and is like, click, 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 click on an ad, it doesn't count anymore. They fixed it. They basically have things in place now to stop that from happening. I was never bad for, banned from AdSense, never. I was suspended temporarily from AdSense a long, 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 long time ago. 2010, I was suspended from AdSense. And back then, YouTube didn't have a policy on how long a suspension lasted or anything. So basically it was like indefinite. You didn't know if you would ever get unbanned or not. Eventually I did get unbanned. Eventually I did get unbanned from AdSense and I was able to run my own ads on videos and I've been doing that for many, many years now. Uh, ever since, basically when I became a full-time streamer um, and I broke up I broke up with Machinima, for one year I was with Curse and since then, after that, so we're talking three, four years, I've been doing my own thing with my ads. Um, and of course, we all know the story, I'm not going to get into it, how 10 years ago <clears throat> and I saved that AdSense account until I needed it and now I'm able to use it. It blatantly illegal AdSense account. Like, you are a fucking idiot. All right? Like, what on earth are you talking about? Now, the other hilarious part about all of this is you got these moronic conspiracy theorists who are in the stream chat right now, and they're saying, But Phil, you did ask people to click on your ads on YouTube. Yeah, when was that video made? Think about this. There was a video made. It was my face reveal video from the first half of 29, uh, 2009, excuse me, so the first half of 2009, I did a vlog with a face reveal video, and I very stupidly said in that video, one of the ways to help me out would be, I, th I think I said, to, I might have said to click on the ads, I don't remember, okay? I, don't, I, I know that I basically said something about interacting with ads or clicking on ads, okay? That video was put out in the first half of 2009, and never once was I ever contacted by YouTube, to say, oh, you broke our terms of service by doing this. The video was never taken down. The video is still live on the internet to this day. You could still watch it in its entirety, right? I never had any negative consequences as a result of that video, okay? So the hilarious stupidity of idiots who just want to parrot stuff and say, oh, the reason that Phil lost his AdSense in late 2010 is because of so uh, because this video where he said to click on ads. The video was out for a year and a half, you dingus. A year and a half. No, no negative repercussions happened a year and a half later as a result of a vlog that, you know what I mean? No, what happened was I lost my job, people felt bad, and they went and they clicked on those ads to try to help me out at that point. That's what happened. It had nothing to do with the video a year and a half before. You'd have to be a complete fucking moron to think that, but these people who say that are complete fucking morons. Compared to Philips' camera method, these other recording styles provided far higher quality of both video and audio. But even the hardcore fans who were used to his camera recording method were finding frustration with his attitude. In the year of 2013, I started doing direct capture and live streaming. But even then, <clears throat> I still was acting as if basically it wasn't really a job, even though I worked my butt off and I was making ridiculous amounts of content for you guys. I ignored my live streaming audience. I streamed, but didn't talk with you guys at all. I didn't read the chat. I didn't interact with you guys. There was no shout outs, no discussion. It was as if you guys were not there. It was basically like I was ignoring you and I was just sitting here like this, playing a game like this, doing commentary, telling you everything going on in the game, swearing at the game and raging and paying no attention to you whatsoever. All right. <clears throat> now today, I am mature enough I am professional enough and I am smart enough to tell you that that was a big mistake. It was, okay? Um, essentially, what I should have done is I should have identified the trends that were going on in gaming and I should have changed my formula to be interactive. When I did do that in 2017, things changed for me for the better because I'll be honest with you, there was a time frame. I would say probably about 2015 through 2016, when I was absolutely positively bored with my job. I didn't want to just do gameplay commentary anymore, okay? I was tired of it. I felt burnout. I was bored to tears with it. And what I should have done 
was recognized the live streaming trends and became an interactive streamer sooner rather than later. But I was a stubborn idiot and I decided that I was gonna do things differently. When competing with others in online games, he would always degrade his opponent. If he won, he would profess his opponent's lack of skill, and if he lost, he would accuse the opponent of illegitimate tactics or he would complain of faulty controls. That's called cheating, and that's what everyone does online, which is why you shouldn't fucking play online. You, you keep asking for me to do it, so I gotta do what my fans want, so hope you enjoyed this real shit fest session I had tonight. There are people to this day, to this day, that will say, Phil, rage quits all the time. Rage quits all the time. Alright? I've probably played hundreds upon hundreds of games in their entirety in the time that I've covered YouTube and or been a, a full-time streamer. And I've probably quit less than maybe like 50 games. Okay? And every time I quit, it's not rage quit. Usually there's a j justification. I just don't want to play it anymore. The viewers are bored, etc., etc. But they'll tell you I rage quit games and then they'll find like one or two times I did and cite those as examples. I've been doing this for 13 fucking years, but that's what simpletons do. Simpletons will actually bring up like, oh, everything is black and white. And because he did it once, he always does it. Here's the one example. <laughs> like, okay, dude, whatever you say, you're so full of shit. If I could change my, my, my personality so that I didn't get like angry at certain things, right? That would be better, I think, because I think that I tend certain things tend to cause me a lot of rage on stream, and I wish I didn't get that full of rage sometimes. So I'm not going to do that kind of style of commentary because that's not who I am anymore. I've definitely matured and changed over the years for the better. And am I PC? Fuck no. You know, I swear I'll still be very honest. I rage at things, you know, but at the very same time, you, you're not going to come here and be so perturbed at sexual content anymore, you know. Uh, admittedly, the years, I say, 2008 through, like, maybe 2013, that was a big thing when it came to Phil. It was always about that. Now it ain't like that anymore. And it's very different. I think a lot, I, I have a different kind of viewer base now because it's not like that anymore, okay? <clears throat> so there you go. This last complaint may have merit, as his temper would often manifest as abuse of his equipment. This is fucking bullshit! Move, asshole! The only thing that I can think, now this is, I've had, I personally have had rage before. Don't get me wrong. Playing games, fighting games in arcades, playing fighting games at home, and even I remember, you know, one or two playthroughs where I got so angry, I sm smashed, angrily smashed my controller down on my old, my old table in Connecticut, and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> uh, I definitely did not do not do that stuff anymore. Like I get, I'll get angry, but I'm not gonna smash my equipment. My equipment's too, too important and too valuable for me to be smashing around and everything. You know, I need it to be functioning properly. For example, when game reviewer Mitch Dyer posted a review for IGN with which he disagreed, he attacked Dyer for not providing an objective review, and after the argument, Philip posted a vlog onto his King of Hate HD YouTube channel attacking him further. And he just got all offended that, like, I told him that I work full-time on YouTube. Like, okay, jealous much? That's what I should say, jealous much? But anyway... <laughs> after, like... 13 years, I still have a rivalry with Mitch Dyer. No, I don't. No one, who cares about fucking name Mitch Dyer? Does he even exist? I don't think about Mitch Dyer, ever. Unless you bring him up, I don't even remember the guy fucking exists. That was a name from my early days on YouTube. He was a reviewer who was an independent reviewer. He wasn't actually hired by anyone. He was one of these indie guys who would do one-off articles on websites. And I remember he wrote a few really terrible fucking reviews, one of which for uh, Double Dragon Neon. <clears throat> and another one I can't even remember, then during the coverage, the launch coverage of, of Xbox One, he com completely botched an article and wrote an article for a major gaming website that had complete misinformation about Killer Instinct as a launch title for Xbox One. He had it that every character was going to be an individual DLC you had to pay for. It was completely false. He made it up. He didn't have full information. He released the whole article based on hearsay. Um, then they had to retract the article because he was an idiot. So... That's all I remember about Mitch Dyer. Like, I, I just remember that I, I basically criticized him very strongly in videos, and then people messaged him on Twitter about it, and he tweeted at me, and I tweeted at him basically saying he's, a, he's an irresponsible idiot, okay? Years later, he gets hired full-time by IGN. This guy who has a track record of doing terrible reviews 
and being irresponsible, gets hired by IGN, okay? Now, <clears throat> I have absolutely no idea if this guy still has a job or not. I don't care. This was years and years and years ago. I don't think about this crap. For me, the day that IGN hired Mitch Dyer as a fucking editor, uh, writer, that was it for me. Like, I just would never trust anything they've ever done ever again. Because that guy was proven to be a hack for some of the horrible work he'd done, and they fucking hired him anyway. So, just proves they didn't give a shit. In light of these problems, Philip's viewership, and therefore his livelihood, began slipping. Between November of 2011 and April of 2012, he would drop from nearly 13.5 million monthly views to 5.3 million, a drop of over 60%, after which his viewership continued to slip in a downward trend for the rest of the year. When I was back on YouTube, 2011-2012, when I was rolling in views and money, I didn't ever talk about it either. It wasn't until the decline in 2013, 2014 where it became a regular topic of discussion because I need to keep paying my bills, okay? It's that simple. 2008, I only made videos for a few months. 2009, very positive, everyone loved me on YouTube. 2010, very positive, everyone loved me on YouTube. 2011, when I started making a living, uh-oh, Phil's making money doing this? Well, that's it. You know, that now we got to start writing them all because that's not fair that he makes money playing video games, right? That's when the negativity started. So I'd say maybe even you want to say full year 2011 was positive. All right, 2012, 13, 14, 15, negative. A lot of negativity tossed up towards me, right? I've had more years where the majority of YouTubers think that I'm an asshole than have actually liked what I do. But I'm still fucking here. So just think about that. I'm still here. Like, I'm. how could I not say that I've pushed forward and, and just persevered against all this shit? Like, think about that. I had a couple years where I was virally popular in a positive way, and since then, negative, negative, I'm still fucking here, and I don't give a shit, and I'm not gonna give up, right? So, you know, it's just, it's, it's really just dedication. Maybe it's just I'm an idiot. Maybe I'm just so fucking stubborn. Things got even worse for him after Machinima renegotiated his contract later in the year, reducing his pay. They said, we don't have those contracts anymore, and we've been told by even our, our accounting, our finance department, they're not viable, they don't make money, they don't even cover each other cost-wise. So I was losing Machinima money for some amount of years that I was still under this contract, so they had to renegotiate me into a still pretty ridiculously fair contract, to which point I didn't want to leave Machinima, but basically that meant I was going to lose a lot more money. And trust me... I looked out there, I talked with three different other companies to see what else was out there and what they were offering. And even though people tend to talk shit about Machinima all the time, I can confirm with you that the contract I'm with with Machinima right now is way better than anything anyone else is offering, period, out there. It's actually that ridiculously fair in my favor that I would be an idiot to leave Machinima and, and their partnership, all right? Especially with all the tools and things that they do to help me and the fact that I, I, I mean, all the music I put in my edited videos, Machinima gives to me for free. All the, the help that I need with YouTube issues or if I get a false copyright strike, the reason it gets cleared up more quickly is because Machinima has my back. I'd be an idiot to not be with Machinima anymore, okay? And, in fact, because of a direct result of all this negativity, right, I had... Copyright strikes, taking money out of my pocket, a new contract that means I was going to get paid less. I had a lot of uncertainty, and I said, I think I want to develop a new plan for the year of 2016. And I worked with Machinima, and they worked with me to allow this plan to launch properly the way that I wanted it to. So now let's get to that. So because of all this, I knew, you know, decreasing views on my raw gameplay and streams, uh, less money being made because the copyright strikes took me out of YouTube search, and... Uh, a contract that was going to pay me less regardless, no matter how well I did, I was going to be making less money. I knew something had to change in 2016 if I was going to remain afloat. It just There was no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It had to happen or else I wasn't going to be able to do this full time anymore, period. It was going to be the end of me doing YouTube. Many indicted him for his inflexibility, an argument bolstered by his adamant refusal to alter his content production or release methods. At the very same time, I wanted to do upgrades to the streams. I talked about, oh, let's get a green screen, a better webcam. Let's do all these improvements and things that we can do to the stream. But to do that, I really need a new PC. Because my PC, I've been using every single day full-time since 2014. And this PC is at its limits of what it can do. If I even added a new webcam that used a tiny bit more memory, it would crap everything out. So, being that my webcam's old, my setup's old, I said, this would be the year. 
all right i can upgrade everything will be great that's the whole plan for 2021 is to keep doing these great streams on twitch to keep pumping out the quality that i'm doing and improve the quality slowly over the course of the year because i can improve all my hardware setup for the first time in many years because i don't have these financial worries on my back anymore okay Sometime over the course of 2011, Philip had started dating a woman named Liana Hongen, known better by the pseudonym Panda Lee. You know, and then I broke up with Liana and uh, ended up, you know, that ended and then I didn't tell anyone. That was the other thing. God forbid that I share personal stuff like that anymore because of all the horrendous things that had happened to me for revealing personal information in the past, right? You know, every time personal information leaked, People would turn it into something horrendous and bad and negative that I did something wrong and I'm a horrible person. And I knew that if people knew that we had broken up when we had kind of just gotten engaged, that that would be turned into something awful again. So I kept it a secret for months. I mean, I don't, I don't think I even revealed that we had broken up until, what was it, sometime in like mid-June or something like that? That was almost two months later. But he says, do you miss Leanna? Of course I do. Of course I do. It sucks when you're with someone, you know, for two years it was a long distance relationship, and then for three years we lived here in person. Of course I miss her. I mean, what a silly question. But, you know, you gotta move on. You can't live in the past. Already it was over a month I've been, you know, not with her, and you gotta get used to it. Um, he says, is there one thing you would like to change between the two? Yeah, I would have liked that we didn't fucking basically fall, f f grow apart and, you know, the whole thing fall apart. But again... I'm not going into the details about it because it's our business and no one else's. Many were shocked to learn that Liana was 11 years Phillips Jr. and that they had started dating just after she had turned 18. The worst by far, the absolute worst thing that was said about me was that I'm a pedophile. That my girlfriend Liana was underage when I started dating her and having sex with her and all that. It's completely fucking fabricated and false. She was over the legal age of consent before I ever even spoke with her. So the people who say this literally pull shit out of their ass and make it up. But that's the problem. Once that rumor is on the internet, once that accusation is on the internet, people that who are dumb, who are fucking gullible, who aren't intelligent and aren't going to take five minutes to research everything are going to take it. Oh, it's, it's true, right? It's true. It's got to be true. 2011 also marked other strange behaviors from Philip. For example, for his DSP Tries It series, he took video of himself showering with an Axe body scrubber. In late 2010, this was before I even grew my hair and I had a goatee, back when I was still old school looking Phil from the first two years of stuff that I used to do on YouTube. One day, when I was trying to think of content that I could put on my vlogging channel, The King of Hate HD, not this one, but the original vlogging channel, The King of Hate HD, um, this was after I had just lost my job and I didn't know how I was going to pay the bills anymore and you couldn't even monetize gameplay videos. So I had put ads on the videos on th that vlogging channel and I was trying to find things that would bring people to the vlogging channel. So one night I had a few too many to drink and I said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do the Axe Body Detailer DSP Tries It. What this was was a little loofah scrub thing that men could buy or was supposed to be for men and you scrub your body with it. Okay. Um... I made this video of me in the shower topless, scrubbing my body, basically slurring my words because I had drunk, drank so much, all right? Uh, it went viral. Within a day, the thing had something like 30,000 views, if not more. Um, and honestly, because I was making so much, you know, I, there was there were ads on it and people were, were going crazy for the ads. I made like a thousand bucks in a day on that video, which is out of control, right? But that video got so much attention. Guess what? That was the video that triggered YouTube seven plus years ago to think that I was cheating with the AdSense program. And they contacted me and said, we're kicking you out of the AdSense program on this channel because we suspect that you're that you're, you're, you're sitting there clicking on the video to get ad revenue because you made so much in one day. And I was like, I didn't. It was the viewers. The viewers went nuts for this crazy video and probably went over and went, oh, I want to support Phil, the underdog, he just lost his job. Let's all click on the ads or whatever, which you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to do that on YouTube. No, you're not supposed to ever try to ask, uh, uh, have someone click on ads or anything. It's supposed to be of their own free will. If I hit 500 subs just for a joke, I'll do a shower video. The DSP tries it. Remember I did one in 2010 where I was in the shower. I'll do another silly video like that. I hit that goal within another week what the shit like seriously i was like huh i couldn't believe it 
Incensed by his banning, Evil AJ published a montage of Philip's gameplay footage of Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty in early 2013, entitling it, This is How You Don't Play MGS2. Look at the guy who made the first This Is How You Don't Play video, Evil AJ. He's done his own shit, no one gives a fuck about it. No one watches his streams, no one watches his videos on YouTube, but those couple videos he made about me gave him viral popularity. And that's the thing, that's what these people realize. I, if you just do negative drama videos on YouTube, you'll get popular. But if you actually do something constructive, no one wants to see your shit because you suck, because you're a fucking hack. And that's the case. These people couldn't ever be a, a fucking streamer like me and be popular because they're not entertaining. They're just negative shitheads, okay? Throughout the nearly hour-long montage, he peppered in comments from viewers frustrated with how poorly Philip was playing, especially noting how he was ignoring important mechanics as a direct response to Philip's claim that viewers were extremely positive to the playthrough. I told you guys over the years, at first I was very, very defensive, and that was the wrong way to go about it. People have <clears throat> openly said, maybe I should have embraced this is how you don't play. Um... But, you know, from my perspective, it was kind of people stealing my content without my permission. Like, if someone said, I want to make a funny montage of you failing and ask my permission to do it, I probably would have said yes. No one ever did. They just illegally stole my content and did it without my permission. And that's kind of what irked me back in the day. But, admittedly, if I had been more open to it and I hadn't been so defensive about it, it probably wouldn't have become such a big negative movement against me. Maybe it would have been more laugh with Phil than laugh at it, right? Um, so, that being said, <clears throat> okay, I openly admit... This is how you don't play had value, especially back then when I was putting out a million videos a day. Rather than sifting through a million videos, you could watch someone who basically made a highlight reel. Now, of course, over the years, this is how you don't play became way more malicious to the point where it was more about insulting, disgusting comments about myself and my family members than it even was about the gameplay in the video. When you're only saying personal insults versus criticizing the gameplay, then what? how can you even call it this is how you don't play? And I think what ended up happening was over the years things changed you know it became all right phil's the guy who you laugh at to phil's the guy who you completely tear a new asshole to get cheap clickbait views on your content on youtube and that's not cool and that's f perfectly fine there was one point many many years ago where i was an idiot and i thought that that stuff was bad in my opinion um i don't care if you make fun of my gameplay at all i just don't give a shit i really don't um i don't think that it's malicious to the point where it hurts me for someone to watch a montage of my content on someone else's channel. A lot of people have told me over the years they saw those comp uh, those compilations and then they actually come over to the streams of the videos and then they like the stuff and they, they watch live. Here's an example. Morningstar just cheered. Thank you for the support, Morningstar. All right? It's been pretty commonplace since the early days of This Is How You Don't Play, which started around 2012, okay, that people have made me like the whipping boy of YouTube. They take things I say out of context they make up ridiculous conspiracy theories about me, and they just basically put out slanderous, defamatory videos about me constantly on YouTube. Because of this, there is now a hate mob that literally does everything they possibly can to ruin myself and my business. And one of the active things that they've absolutely done over the years is they've come to DSP Gaming and thumbed down every single video I've ever put out from the last, like, seven, eight years. This is not exaggeration. It doesn't matter what kind of a video I'm putting out, it's as long as it's on DSP Gaming, it will receive an insane amount of dislikes. Right now, I could upload a video on DSP Gaming where I just go, thumbs up, everyone, and that's it. And the video would get an insane amount of dislikes. Sadly, what ended up happening was people would, would actually go to my videos to say nasty things in the comments just for the sake of it. Because then other people would make a video just like showing the comments of the video how nasty they were. And then applying them to, like, me f doing something bad in a gameplay video. So it'd be like, oh, look, here's Phil filling Metal Gear Solid. Let's go to the comments. And they go down there and there'd be something like, Phil's a rap bastard piece of shit. Phil's the worst gamer on the planet. It was, like, the worst stuff. And it, basically, people who were longtime viewers of mine got so fed up with it. And in 2017, they actually said, Phil, we'd much rather actually just have you turn comments off forever. Because the comments in 95% is just assholes trying to get noticed in a negative video made about you rather than uh, us who want to legitimately talk can't even do it. it you can't even make our legitimate positive comments out so i turned them off and quite frankly it didn't hurt a thing most people who are positive and like my stuff will find another way to discuss it whether it's coming to my twitter whether it's coming to a live stream and hanging out with me here my forums they have other methods that they can discuss my content and they don't have to fucking you know sit there and, sh and deal with all the people shitting on it constantly so that's why i turned it off
<laughs> In short order, these montages would overtake Philip's own video content when searching for his channel due to their popularity, pushing his own content farther down the search results. I've already told you guys, there's zero potential for me to ever grow on YouTube because of YouTube's setup. It's automated setup pushes dramatic, slanderous, negative content to the forefront of the website. That's why there's entire YouTubers who all they do is talk about drama, is talk about slander and rumors, and pretend to cover news stories when in reality all they do is spin it in a, in a clickbaity way. And that's, I mean, that, that's YouTube. That's what YouTube has become through automation. They automated the site and let all the bullshit go to the top of the crop and everything else gets shoved under the rug. So you search for me and you get a million people making fun of me or literally just making shit up about me before you actually get to me. And that's what YouTube's okay with that apparently. This is what they wanted their site to become. So that's why I don't care about YouTube. Like I said, YouTube is the place where I archive my videos. It's an archive of my content. You know, my streams are my priority and my focus. YouTube is the afterthought. It's where, you know, if you miss the stream, you can go check it out. But I know for a fact DSP Gaming is never going to see any kind of significant growth on there. It's just had too much abuse, years and years of systematic abuse from people, you know. For example, one user criticized Philip's belief that his Let's Play videos were works of art and that the game and his commentary are his ingredients to create it. Yeah. They're $60. I paid them their fee to utilize the ingredients to make my work of art. This is a business. This is how I make my money. You know, I'm not someone who does this casually and has a job outside of this. And therefore, you're right. If I want to play Ori in the Blind Forest and I start to play it, and in general, people are saying this is boring and they stop tuning in and no one's contributing and no one's watching it on YouTube. It's very hard for me to continue on with a playthrough like that. And that case in point, that's exactly what happened a few years ago when the first Ori and the Blind Forest released. I did give it a shot and no one liked it. And I said, well, regardless of if I'm liking it or not, I guess I just got to kind of throw my hands up. Now, the exception to the rule, like I said, is if I'm at a time of year when there's something that's so popular, it doesn't matter. And I remember, like, there was this game Child of Light that I played a few years back. That also was a Metroidvania-style game like Ori, but it had turn-based uh, combat elements as well in it. N it don't, well, didn't get a lot of views. Not a lot of people liked me playing it, but I loved it. And at the time, I was playing other games that were getting big attention. So I was able to balance Child of Light with the other games, and it didn't matter that it didn't get a lot of attention. Okay? So that's kind of the key. All right, that is the key where if I'm in a situation where things are going so well with something else, then I have the flexibility to then go out and do other stuff too that maybe isn't as exciting, okay? To supplement his income, he began streaming on a new platform called Twitch, which offered an online venue for gamers to play games and interact with fans live. Uh, people don't like you, Twitch. People hate you. They think you're scum. They think you fucked up everything on the site that people love. People were on your site for years building communities up, and now they don't even want to turn on their fucking streams on your business anymore because they're disgusted on a daily basis of the shit that goes down over there. You know what I'm saying? So what did you think would happen? People would like you? Um, if you stream on both platforms, you cannot be a partner on both. You can only be a partner on one or the other. If you act actually... The truth of the matter is thus, if you're a partner on Twitch, they don't want you to stream anywhere. I was outright told that when I was a partner on Twitch, when I had a partner manager, that partner manager said to me, if you stream anywhere else, you're at risk of losing your partnership with us. We can terminate it whenever we want. To which I told him, no, that's not true. That's illegal. And he argued with me. And I said, I don't care what you say as my partner manager. You're wrong. I know my rights. I can stream wherever I want. I just can't monetize somewhere else. And he was actually saying, well, just so you know, we see it in a very negative light if you stream somewhere else when you're in a partnership with us. And I was like, whatever you say, dude, because he's just a fucking idiot figurehead anyway trying to spew out bullshit to me. I never told you guys this, but yeah, this guy who was my partner manager used to say shit like that all the time and make threats to me behind the scenes. And I kind of laughed it off like this guy legally thinks he could just laugh, you know, threaten me all the time and say this and that. And it was all bullshit. But anyway, they really don't want you to be streaming anywhere else if you're a partner on Twitch at all. So if I became a partner on Twitch again, I would have to not stream anywhere else at, or else they might just terminate my partnership again, okay? 
Most egregious to his fanbase was when his girlfriend, Liana, derided the game Kingdom Hearts 2 in the chat section while Philip was playing it, and when the chat devolved into argumentation, Philip locked the chat so that only subscribers could talk. The bad reputation from Philip had suddenly spilled over onto Liana, too. So, fuck all of you who are acting immature. This is what you get now. We're putting it into sub-only mode. You fucking idiots. I'm here trying to play a fucking game. It's hard to concentrate when a bunch of little immature- You're sitting in a group of people who are toxic, who all they want to do is crap on stuff. They literally add nothing to life. If they didn't exist, the world would be a better place. And why are you like that? Oh, because I'm just, that's how I get my jollies off because I feel like I, I have a, a, a feeling of belonging by being in a similar group of people who just like to hate on people. It's like, wow, well, let me tell you something. You'll get a much better feeling if you are a good person or a positive person than someone who just wants to hate on people and hurt people. But they don't get that because, again, like I already said, I used to be like that too when I was younger, but I changed for the better. And they can too if they have this moment of realization. They just need to have that moment. Okay? 2014 saw major changes for Philip. Taking out more loans, he purchased a new condominium, this one in Seattle, Washington, bringing Leanna to live with him. He believed that a new location would provide him with the motivation and energy to surge back into popularity. Um, I used to live in Connecticut. I lived in Connecticut my whole life until a few years ago. I wanted to change, and I knew with the amount of money that I was making and all of that, that that was the right time to do it, because I knew that YouTube wasn't going to become, it wasn't going to always be this insanely lucrative thing for me. At that point in my life, I had paid off all of my debt. I had no outstanding debt on, like, credit cards or anything, so I was good to go, and I said, if I'm going to ever move out of Connecticut, I need to do it now, so I started doing research. And the first thing I researched was taxes, because the bottom line is, in the state of Connecticut, I was paying insane taxes. I was paying state tax, income tax, federal income tax. I was paying insane property taxes, insane vehicle taxes. Basically, sales tax, everything in Connecticut was high. And I did the math, and I realized that if I just moved to certain states, I could be saving over, I'm not even kidding you, tens of thousands of dollars a fucking year just because I live somewhere else, right? I was scratching my head like, why the fuck am I staying in Connecticut? Like, why would I stay here? You know, yeah, my family's there, but outside of just my my parents, there's nothing really that was attaching me to be there besides Italian food, which is amazing in, in Connecticut. And I know that because now I live in Washington and there's a fault of Italian food out here sucks. Washington State has no state income tax. So I pay the same federal tax as I was paying when I lived in Connecticut, but no state tax. So right off the bat, thousands of dollars in my pocket into the business that was just getting pissed away living in Connecticut. Now the trade-off in Washington state is the sales tax here is much higher. The sales tax here is 9%. In Connecticut, it was six. But yeah, that's a 3% increase on what I choose to spend. So I wanted to move to a warmer climate where I wasn't gonna have snow and shit. But then I started looking, I was like, Florida, oh my God, Florida, they have the humidity all year. I didn't want that. Texas, they have crazy overbearing heat for a lot of the year. So really, when I was looking at all the climates, Washington State made the most sense. It's more moderate. Yes, there's heat in the summer. Yes, there's cold in the winter. But usually, it's in between somewhere. We actually have long and extended periods of like fall and spring here where you get that moderate temperature. Right now, I'm in my office. My window's open. I'm fine. I'm not hot at all, which is awesome. You know, it's awesome to have that and not have to worry about I'm going to be burning up or whatever. In Connecticut... When, in the summer, I was burning the fuck up, and in the winter, I was freezing my balls off. Here, for most part of the year, I'm fine. And after about maybe four months of co going back and forth with this woman and explaining to her what we were looking for in a house and stuff like that, um, she had narrowed it down to like five places in this local area right outside of Seattle. So technically, I am, I do live in Seattle, but I don't live in Seattle. It's really weird. Like, they call it a different thing, but they still list things as Seattle here. I don't get it. I mean, Seattle area, I don't know. But we're basically 35, 40 minutes from Seattle if we just drive. We're in, like, the outskirts. We can get right into the city whenever we want. That's what we wanted. We wanted a city or a town that was very close to Seattle, so when we want to go there, we can. But that it's not in Seattle, so you're not paying more taxes and you're not having to deal with all that traffic and shit. <clears throat> so it was a long pro- the whole process itself from start to finish took about a year. Uh, we had to look at different locations in the United States, see what kind of a loan I could get based off of my income and all of that, and then trying to narrowing it down, and then finally homing in on an area. It's a very lengthy process, very time-consuming, and by the way, it is stressful too, because it doesn't always work out the way you want. It took a while for me to get this fucking loan, because the banks were telling me, well, what you make isn't, isn't consistent income, and I'm like, well, I've been doing it since 20... 
2008. I've been making money with it since 2011. It's 2014. Three years of consistent income isn't enough. Well, no, because it's YouTube and you're not hired by a, you know, a company with a salary. They didn't want to give me a, it was a nightmare in a lot of ways, but we got it done. We moved, couldn't be happier. Hopefully that was some of the information will help you out. His problems would worsen later in the year after a dispute with Twitch admins. At the time, Twitch's servers were unable to handle too much bandwidth, and so, when Philip was streaming at a quality that the servers were unable to handle, they politely requested that he reduce the bitrate of his stream. Philip, annoyed, asked why other streamers could stream at higher bit rates, but the Twitch admin who contacted him remained firm that others did not and that Philip must abide by the rules as other content creators did. Unwilling to accept the drop in quality, he began streaming on YouTube instead, who had launched their streaming platform, but received far fewer views, again decreasing his income while he was still in debt for the condominium. Smile empty soul, I could stream at 60 frames per second right now. My problem is Twitch, not my equipment. My equipment is good enough to do 1080p 60 frames per second, but Twitch doesn't allow the bitrate required to do it. If I did it, it would be choppy as fuck on Twitch. So, it's it's real, it's, it's a Twitch side issue. If Twitch upgrades for this next console gen and says we'll allow higher bitrate, then I could do it, but if not, I'm stuck at where I am. When I streamed on YouTube exclusively, I was always at 1080p 60 frames, no matter what game I played. If I had been still on Twitch at the end of this year, can you imagine if I just played all those new releases we just did at 720p? I mean, wow! I can't believe... <laughs> all these new consoles, and I can't even take advantage of the graphics because they fucking won't let you broadcast over there at a reasonable bitrate. It doesn't make any sense at all, right? <clears throat> on June 24th, five months after the launch of his Patreon, Philip was swatted while he was streaming. On June 26th, just two days after the swatting attack, Philip's stream was struck again, this time with a dedicated denial of service attack, better known as a DDoS. The function of such an attack is to overwhelm a person's internet modem, temporarily shutting off internet access. But the 2014-2015, I really feel, were the years when the big hate against me happened on the internet. And for some reason, I became like the villain of content creation on YouTube. Like people were, oh, how dare Phil be successful and still have a viewer base and still make a living. Look, he moved out to a nice house in Washington. He doesn't deserve any of that success. We should really do everything we can to like destroy him in his life. Which I wish I was joking about, except if you look at the track history of what happened, uh, you know, me being DDoSed or DDoSed, whatever you want to say, I don't even know, d uh, doxed, swatted, having my YouTube channel set up as, as a booby trap basically with fan art and then hit false DMCA strikes against it. Like within a year, year and a half, I had such an insane amount of toxic, bad things happen to me, you know, that th that time really felt so weird. A small number of people began flagging some of Philip's videos, claiming that the fan art in the videos was utilized without the permission of the artist. If he were to receive a third strike on either account, the respective account would be taken offline temporarily, cutting him off from one of his few precious sources of revenue. When the negativity against me on the internet was really at a peak, um, and everyone was just shitting on me and trying to destroy my life and destroy my YouTube channel and everything, which they pretty much did, um, you know, the year when I was doxxed, swatted, DDoS attacked, and had my YouTube channel destroyed by false copyright strikes. That was pretty much the year when, like, I almost broke and was like, I don't want to do this anymore because there, it's just, it's too much pain and too much suffering and it's not worth it. Um, and basically I had to discipline myself and stay in that discipline and say, no, I have to stay the course. I have to stick with this. I have to be disciplined and know that if I tough this out, that there's going to be some kind of a light at the end of a tunnel. It might be a tunnel that's 20 years long, but I'm eventually going to get to the end of this tunnel and I'm going to persevere as long as I stick with it, you know? Uh, and that's been always been my attitude is even though I have these hardships that I face on a daily basis and things that fall apart and just surprise me with shocking negative shit, at the very least, I still discipline myself to never give up and to keep, stay the course and to try to keep it going, you know? Uh, and so far, so good. 
At the recommendation of Machinima, Philip set all of his videos that used fan art as private, thus removing them from public accessibility, but this action had an unintended consequence. YouTube's search algorithms considered the views on these videos to be lost. Matter of fact, folks, the reason that I'm in a bad situation now, it, financially in particular, is because of people doing nasty shit to me. If I never got false copyright strikes against DSP Gaming and all that shit, the channel still would probably have been just maybe declined a little bit, but no way would it have dipped the way it looked. I, I'm going to be really, go ahead, because everyone loves to use it, Social Blade. Go look at Social Blade and go take a look at the month when I got the false copyright strikes. The channel was in you know jeopardy of being shut down. And I was advised by YouTube staff to delete the videos that had fan art in them. You will see that my channel went like this because I had to delete had to delete those videos. It came back up the next you know next month with positive views, but then it just went like this because I, I was from then on I was out of YouTube search and YouTube algorithms and everything. And you're talking someone who worked their ass off to get where I was, who got fucked by a bunch of kids. You know, and it's, I've never been able to recover since then. Things have just gotten worse. It's a, it's a big a landslide of negative stuff that's happened since then because of that, because of those false copyright strikes that I can never recover from. You know, I don't know what else to say or do. Um, that's the truth of the matter. Those false copyright strikes put me single-handedly in the financial situation that I'm in now because if they never happened, I would have been making enough money to easily pay off all of my financial obligations and not have a problem with anything going on with my finances right now. I wouldn't have to be on stream and on videos begging you guys for help during bad times when things are tight. Never. I never would have been in that bad of a financial situation if it weren't for those direct actions from a bunch of fucking assholes, from a group that planned it out step by fucking step to do it again to me. Um... And now I don't know if I will ever, at this point, especially with what I'm getting notice of today, um, I don't know if I'll ever, ever get back to financially or healthy either. To shore up his income, he announced yet another channel, this one called KO Gaming, which he launched on January 14th, 2016. My side project, which had become very popular in 2016, known as KO Gaming, this is the channel for edited style content like countdowns and reviews, they demonetized it for no reason. It wasn't like, oh, you did something wrong and here you go. They just decided to blacklist the channel. So every video I uploaded was already demonetized by, by when it went live. So it was kind of like a double slap in the face. It was like, can't make a living doing gameplay. Oh, my face. And all of a sudden a hand came from the other direction. Can't make a living doing edited content. Oh, double slap. And then two fists came together like, Psh oh, it just destroyed me. And I said, well, if this is how YouTube's going to treat me, I'm not going to focus on YouTube. I'm going to go elsewhere. And I did for five years. I focused on being a full-time live streamer over on Twitch, right? Well, I guess it was more like four, four and a half years. Um, and man, it worked. We built up a nice community there and everything. But during that time when I was focusing solely on Twitch, uh, I basically neglected YouTube. And this is what happened is DSP Gaming was a channel that at one point was at the top of gaming. Then it kind of was mid... Then it went way down, right? Like bottom of the barrel, no one thinks of DSP Gaming anymore for game stuff because I basically was a streamer, okay? And that's my fault. I'll take responsibility for that. You know, who know? you never know with these things. You never know the, what's going to happen. So this channel fell into disrepair. I turned off the comments. I never mentioned likes or dislikes, and I just let it be, right? So what happened? You guys could still watch the videos if you wanted. But there was zero engagement with the content, and therefore, the channel just fell less and less and less prominent on YouTube to the point where now it's like you can't even find it anymore, okay? They basically red flagged the channel. Every video that I uploaded to KO Gaming auto got demonetized, and then I had to dispute that and have each video manually re-monetized, which took days. So what's the point of putting out new content on a channel when for the first few days every video is live I can't make any money on it, Okay? On the same time that that happened, YouTube basically suffered the adpocalypse, which means overnight in February of 2017, so this is five years ago, YouTube lost the vast majority of major advertisers on the site, including Walmart, Starbucks, all these companies that were giant corporations paying them ridiculous amounts of money for ads. They all pulled their ads from YouTube for various different reasons we don't need to get into today, okay? Philip began showing strange patterns in his Patreon rewards during 2015 as well. 
Most notably, he had asked for a significant amount of money to produce a reboot of an old, cheaply produced show he had created with some friends about four years prior called Project 7. However, after collecting the money, he stated that he would have to postpone the filming of the show indefinitely to concentrate on his regular content. I had a goal set up for the summertime where I was going to put out a Project 7 trailer. I was going to put out this trailer, and if the trailer went well, I was planning on doing maybe even a full reboot of Project 7 as a completely different show than what I had put out in 2012. It was going to be like a new show with the original premise where I was going to play through Final Fantasy 7 and do stuff like that. So I was curious how people would react if I like put effort into editing a trailer and, and saying I would redo the series. So I had a goal on Patreon if I hit a certain level of funding, all right? I would actually spend time away from my streams and my videos to put effort into putting out this trailer, okay? That's what it was. What ended up happening was, over the course of the summer, a bunch of games came out that surprisingly people wanted to see me play, like, right away. People were actually like, wow, this was shocking. We didn't expect this to happen, but we want you to play this game and this game and this game. And I was like, well, guys, but I already committed via Patreon with people supporting me. I committed to doing this trailer. So what do you want? And literally, I proposed this publicly to my viewership. And the vast majority of people responded and said, we just want you to play the new games. We don't care about the fucking bullshit. That was a nice idea of something different. But we support you. We want you work here to see you play fun games. That's what we want you to do. There was one particular fan of mine at the time who was very upset. He contacted me behind the scenes telling me how upset he was. And you know what? He had a valid criticism and concern. I had set up a goal specifically to do the trailer. I did not do the trailer. I did not live up to the expectation. And that one particular guy actually said to me, I'm so upset, I'm pulling my Patreon support from you and I'm not going to do Patreon for you anymore. I'm so upset. I said, fair enough. You 100% deserve that. You, That's fine. You, that is a, a, a fair and, and very rational response to me not doing something that I promised, even though the vast majority of people said don't do it. You specifically wanted it. You contributed to see it. You didn't see it. You're pulling your patron support. Fair enough. That was the one person ever in all the years of people supporting me that got upset about something like that. <laughs> it was it. Never. I mean, people who actually want to support me want to support me because they like the content. They like me. They want to see it continue. They're doing it for the right reasons. They're not coming here and doing transactional thing. Oh, I'm buying a membership so that I can get this back from it. That's not why people really come and support me at all. <clears throat> the scapegoat was the Project 7 scam, which wasn't a scam at all. It was me raising a few hundred dollars on Patreon saying I was going to make a Project 7 reboot trailer, um, which I didn't come through on. I apologized publicly. And the next month on Patreon, I lowered the goals to make up for it because the money had already been collected and spent. So I couldn't give it back. And there was no one to give it back to because there's no way to tell who pledged to Patreon for a specific goal anyway. So instead, I said, okay, I'll lower the goals next month as a way to give back to the people. And, and you know, admittedly, people felt bad. <clears throat> I didn't do the Project 7 trailer. Um, and it is one of my shortcomings over the years that I fessed up to that, yeah, that's something I didn't do. People told me they really didn't want it. But that's something that I didn't live up to as a commitment. And it's one of the mistakes I've made over the years, right? For example, his patrons voted for him to make a best and worst moments montage of his playthrough of Alan Wake, which was to be released that September. However, after the first part received weak viewership, he decided against fulfilling that obligation. You know, I want to do that with all the games that I complete during the hardcore gaming season this year. It's a lot, it's tough. You know, a lot of people said to me, Phil, you haven't done now an Alan Wake, a new Alan Wake montage. Why not? I said, because all my time is going towards reviews. I'm beating the games. You want me to review them. I can't review them. And then also do this. And then also do that. I've got to, you know, use my time wisely. And right now, it seems the majority of people are saying, don't worry about these montages. They're nice when you have a chance to do them. Do them when you have the chance. But for the most part, focus on your gameplay and your review. So I'm doing what the direct viewer feedback is telling me. And I hope that you're enjoying it. All right. He also made a goal for four extra Minecraft sessions, but he neglected that obligation as well, only playing one more session for similar reasons of low viewership. And because of that, I basically crapped all up. People would say, hey, what about Minecraft? Ah, oh, that's a kid's game. Who the fuck plays Minecraft, right? How wrong I was when I finally played Minecraft and realized what an amazing, awesome game it was, right? But this is what I mean. When you're riding a wave of success, you don't get to see outside perspectives because you think your shit doesn't stink right? I was like that back in the day too, really. I was like that back in the day. 
and I get it. On May 1st, 2016, while preparing for a live stream, Philip accidentally streamed himself masturbating. Though the video itself wasn't graphic as it only captured his chest and face, what he was doing was clear. I, play, I remember I was playing the Neo uh, Beta, which is an incredibly difficult game, can't have any distractions. And you know, it's funny because a lot of people have asked, oh, I wonder what it was. I wonder, you know, what could it have been or whatever. And yeah, some people just, they, they, they think that like porn is such an important thing or something. To me, it's a means to an end. You know what I mean? Like I, I probably, it wasn't something, I swear to God, no, here's what happened. All right. You know, you're going to do your, your business and get it over with. So you can get on to other stuff. Obviously for me, I was getting to a stream. I just wanted to fucking stop ha having it bother me. Um, I particularly, particularly don't even remember exactly what it was. Um, I know that it wasn't like any popular porn star or anything like that. Um, it wasn't like I was on a website of, you know, paid porn website where you, there's a this certain lineup of stuff. It was just like one of those, probably Pornhub or something like that. And honestly, I mean, actually, cause I don't do that, you know, ever anymore. You know, why would I do that? Especially anywhere near work equipment. <laughs> that was a really stupid low time in my life, as I told you guys many times. That was like a really, really low time in my life. I was depressed and it was a really dumb thing that I did and I got cut out doing it. <clears throat> um... Essentially, for that to happen again, it had to be intentional. In which case, yeah, that would be the end of my career. So, it's not happening again. <laughs> you know, you can fast forward again to 2016 and the incident. Uh, where basically because of a very stupid thing that I did on a stream, the people tried to, to basically say that Phil should be banned from the internet and shit like that. That certainly didn't go according to plan. But what they wanted to do, it completely backfired in that regard. Okay? Um, mostly because at that time, I did actually learn how to react to that kind of shit when it happened. I had already gone through it multiple times and seeing how it went through multiple times, right? I was able to ride that wave of negativity and actually spin it into some positivity for myself, which was a good thing, right? <clears throat> the dark side Phil is a chronic masturbator who does it in front of thousands of children every morning. <laughs> this is his ritual, and here's the evidence. And they show the screen capture of my face. They're like, oh. They're like yeah. are you crazy? But people believe it because people have talked about it for three and a half years now, and they like yeah. they think that this is like something that that it, what really happened. The true story is it was early morning. The stream, had, I turn on my stream. And I play music. <laughs> now I play music. Back then, I just used to play like the PS4 dashboard theme while I run some promo ads over the screen to show here, you know, go buy something from my Teespring store, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was running it and I accidentally had left my webcam on from the night before hmm. on the screen in the corner. I had no, re no knowledge. Obviously, of it. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it, it's an honest, and it's a stupid, stupid, stupid thing to happen. And I know I'll never live it down. But it's not a big deal to me. Like, it was, I mean, is it embarrassing? Hell yeah. If anything, the one thing that, that's come out of it positive, if anyone asks me, what's the most embarrassing thing that ever happened to you, Phil? I don't have a hard time answering. I got to do <laughs> yeah, right away. Yeah. But outside yeah. of that, like, I was lucky. You're right. I'm always smart. You notice today, my webcam, you don't see anything below the belt here. Yeah. It's always my <laughs> upper torso. This is how it's always been. So I knew when people exaggerate for it to be something so ludicrous, it's like, did you actually even see what it was? Yeah. It's just my O face. That's all it is. <laughs> you don't see anything else. Because this is so hilarious to debunk all of it. I wasn't streaming on Twitch at the time. I was streaming on YouTube. Oh, I, it was oh two, it yeah. Was there two you go. years that I wasn't streaming on Twitch because at one point Twitch had forced me to lower my bit rate. So yeah. there was nothing. The only people who got footage of this were people who literally stalk me every day. And they illegally record my streams just in case something like this happens. And they, boy, did they get their jackpot that day. Oh, right? literally. <laughs> it went everywhere viral within minutes. It was everywhere all over the internet. And, you know, for me, it's like, then that's the thing, the slander. Oh, well, did Twitch ever say anything? Did you, YouTube didn't say anything because I never uploaded it. After ah. it broadcast that first time, it yeah. never was live on any of my channels. So there was no evidence of anything that had ever happened. It was everyone else posting the content. That, ah. that was basically propagating it, not me. So YouTube never contacted me. Machinima did contact me right, and because so, they yeah. were my partnership network at the time. They said, are you okay? Like, what's going on? Did you have like a big fallout? So I was like, eh, Phil, did, he masturbated in front of thousands of children. Oh, no, yeah. There was like 60 people on the pre-stream and no one was watching because it was just the <laughs> ad cards running. So no one was even there. It was just a, a honest, innocent mistake. It wasn't some exhibitionist crazy yeah, stunt yeah. that I pulled or anything. Yeah. <laughs> 
To help salvage his income, he began streaming on Twitch again on November 29th, 2016. You know, I actually streamed on Twitch from 2013 until fall of 2014. Then I left Twitch for YouTube for about two years. Then I came back to Twitch in late 2016, and I streamed on here since then. You know, so that's what? Uh, about almost three more years. So, thank God. For you guys, because in the year of 2016, you guys pounded me. And I don't mean in the butt. I mean, you guys pounded me with advice, good advice in 2016. You guys said, Phil, you may not realize this, but things are different over on Twitch right now. Things are much more positive. All the negative things, the reasons why you left Twitch are changing. It would make sense for you to return to Twitch now because their streaming bitrate is being increased. It's going up. <clears throat> their policies... In regards to a lot of things, the things you didn't used to like are now going away or changing. It really is becoming a lot more gamer-oriented place, and I think you're going to enjoy going back there. Plus, Twitch is growing virally in popularity while YouTube streaming is going nowhere. So I returned to Twitch streaming in November of 2016, and I already had a good standing relationship with Twitch. Well, you guys may not realize this, Curse, who I'm partnered with now, is owned by Twitch, who is owned by Amazon. So it's all one company. So, when I applied for my partnership with Twitch, all right, they reviewed all my information and saw, oh, this is Dark Side Phil. This is the same guy who already streamed with us for years, went away and came back, and now he's doing good on streams. This guy's reliable. Let's do it. And they partnered me. And because of that, at least now I was making less money, but at least I was able to still make money on YouTube and basically kind of saved my butt temporarily because I knew I was going to be able to be partnered with Curse moving forward. So, it basically saved my butt. Your advice to go back to Twitch started, spearheaded this kind of rolling events that allowed me to then be partnered with Curse and allowed all this positive stuff to kind of start happening in 2017. So, Thank you to everyone who was in touch with everything going on on the internet. Thank you to those of you who gave me a really amazing advice. You guys literally saved my ass this year in, in more ways than one, which we'll talk about as we continue in this segment, all right? However, within the month, a company named Curse offered Philip another contract, and Philip's attitude immediately turned again, though some of his thoughts were mixed. On one hand, he was making more money than he had been with his Machinima contract, but on the other, he had lost the protection from automatic content ID claims that Machinima's managed partnership had provided him, meaning that videos of his with copyrighted music or video would have the money earned from them taken away. As you know, I have lost monetization on DSP Gaming because of some nonsense behind the scenes. I was leaving my partnership with Curse Network to go solo and be able to run ads on DSP Gaming uh, privately. And there was a big screw up between Google AdSense and YouTube, which took a good almost three weeks to clear up. But I have great news, guys. As of now, it's actually almost 11 p.m. Uh, on August 7th here, 2018. And I'm recording this and talking very low because my girlfriend is asleep in the other room because she has to work early in the morning. So I'm recording this at as low volume as possible. However, the great news is I regained monetization here on DSP Gaming, ladies and gentlemen. So effective immediately all gameplay videos will begin to be uploaded once again to dsp gaming um and this includes both ongoing playthroughs that i was uploading over on ko gaming so two and a half weeks ago when when dsp gaming got demonetized i sent an appeal to the adsense team at google and i said i don't see how you guys could have suspended this for invalid click activity because it wasn't active it would be one thing if the channel was active. It wasn't. I was under an MCN. I was with Curse Network. It wasn't my advertisements running on the channel. There's no way there could have been invalid click activity. You guys screwed up. Okay? Now, when I did that two and a half weeks ago, I got a form letter email response that said, well, we, we uh, reviewed your situation, and we can't find that your channel says that it's invalid click activity. If you're, if you're sure that this is the case, respond again with you know your your channel ID and we'll look into it. So I did. And this was two and a half weeks ago and nothing came of it. I never got another response, nothing. Okay. So this week I got pissed off because at this point YouTube has stopped responding to me. They're not helping me anymore with their customer support. Basically they've blown me off. And I'm like this is bu bu bullshit. I'm not going to let a 10 year legacy of me being a content creator on the internet possibly be destroyed by a 
automated, bureaucratic piece of crap company that just has horrendous work practices and the fact that you can't talk to humans about any issue and they could just destroy something that you've worked hard on for eight years just because. Not even a legit reason, just because of an error. I wasn't going to put up with that. So I emailed them again and I basically said the following. I said, two and a half weeks ago, I did what you asked. I sent you the information. You never sent me a response. It wasn't like you, you rejected my appeal to the invalid click activity. You just basically never responded. Every, I, t I tell you guys this. I love my life right now. I love the fact that I'm married to a woman who I am deeply in love with. She loves me. We care about each other. We have every time we're together, we have a great time together. Okay. I love Jasper. He's the best pet I've ever had. He's super fun, interactive. He's mischievous, which is cool because it's funny and fun, even though it's not perfect. You know, it's still it's still really cool. And I love my life here in Washington. I love the house I'm living in. I love my job. Everything about life is good right now. If I could get past financial hurdles that I'm facing, you know, that are ongoing. And every time I think I'm about, like I said earlier this year, it looked like I was going to be in the kind of the, the light at the end of the tunnel. And then Twitch kicked me out of the partnership program, and put me back to square one again. But we're getting there. You know what I mean? Like things are certainly not as bad as they were. And every day of my life today really feels like the best day of my life. I mean that too. Like, and I, I used to hate my life. And now it's the complete polar opposite where I love every day and it's, I feel it's getting better and better things. There are good, positive, great things in life ahead for me and my family and I'm really happy about that. So there you go.